Um, thank you. And I'd like to begin, well, thanking the Institute for allowing me to pinch it. Um, I'd like to begin by just simply saying how moved I am uh, last night and today uh, by the number of former students and friends and associates of the Institute have come to uh, celebrate um, both these documents, uh, which the church unfortunately seems uh, not desirous to make uh, known. Um, I, I, when I look at all, these, all of you faces, I, I look over and I, I feel like I'm looking at an old family album. I've been here, <laughs> I've been here far too long, and, uh, <laughs> it, but it's, it's very moving. And I just want to thank you for being part of, personally, for being part of JP2 and the mission of retrieving the truth of the church. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, begin uh, just to say that as a Canadian, I would prefer actually if we had a hockey analogy instead of the baseball one, uh, maybe something like a power play. Um, in fact, I like cricket and I'd prefer to hope that I would pitch a googly, but I don't think that's going to happen. So to continue with the baseball analogy, uh, given that I am pinch hitting, I'm, I hope that I can at least bunt and not strike out. Um, I'd like just to make quickly, before I begin formally, uh, uh, two uh, references to last night to Archbishop De Noia's, uh well, to Ar Archbishop De Noia's comments and then also to Dave Crawford. Unlike Dave Crawford, uh, I did not have bourbon as I was working out this paper uh, into the night but ra or in the morning, but rather I had my, uh, from my English background, I only had tea, so my paper will not be as strong or as invigorating. <laughs> The other thing is with uh, Archbishop De Noia, he used the phrase sex in the head. And when I saw that, it made me think of a visit that my wife and I had uh, about 35 years ago uh, with good friends, uh, a Baptist couple in Toronto. Uh, we decided to go downtown to a Chinese restaurant uh, to have something to eat. And uh, it was a restaurant that was really uh, something out of the Middle Ages. Uh, it was... Uh, we went in there, it was a dark, gloomy atmosphere. In the kitchen, there were these huge, roaring, open flame fires, uh, and, and it looked like everything was covered with soot or whatever, so it was kind of a very unusual place. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it became very quickly evident that one of the problems of contiguous booths, as you find in Chinese restaurants, is that you can always overhear your neighbor's conversation. And it was clear that uh, our young adult neighbors uh, were setting up the evening to what, as Catholics, we would call a near occasion of sin. <laughs> and uh, the, ma uh, the man at one point, in a loud voice, clear voice, uh, was leaning over towards his young lady and said, morality is all in the head. <laughs> to which uh, my good Baptist friend, who had an earthy sense of humor, turned to us and he said, Yes, and immorality is all in the body. <laughs> uh, okay. That's my talk. <laughs> okay, the title is uh, Symbolism, Biblical Symbolism as the Agent of Ontology, the One Flesh Union, and its relationship to the holiness of God. Now, we've heard a lot about the one flesh union, and we're going to hopefully parse it out biblically what it means. Uh, with real deference to my, uh, to my philosophical colleagues, I want to begin by stating that, biblically speaking, in a fallen world, the starting point in the evaluation of the morality of any human act uh, is not the specific human act itself, but rather the divine acts that have preceded, initiated, constitute and provide the ground for human nature and all acts that follow therefrom. These divine acts of both creation and redemption provide a framework or a matrix which reveal the objective criteria for the evaluation of any specific human act. This theocentric analysis situates each human person and each human act within the context of a covenant. The finality of the person and his actions must cohere with the holiness of God. Within this covenantal context, the divine nature and holiness become the criteria by which the intrinsic meaning of acts are revealed and by which they can be evaluated. 
Scripturally, participation in holiness is the telos of both the human person and of all specific actions done in freedom that are constitutive of man's existence. All must be ordered to and cohere with the holiness of God. If moral analysis does not hold this finality of holiness and deter uh, as determinant of, of human action, or rejects it as irrelevant to the moral structure of the act, then the creatureliness of the human person, which includes the givenness of his nature and his freedom, no longer serves as the key to revealing the intrinsic meaning of willed human action. When this happens, the analysis moves out of a biblical worldview and utilizes some other system of value to evaluate the human action. Scripturally, this is not the way of wisdom. Wisdom in scripture is a way of life predicated on one's knowing what your end is and how to get there. While there are strong currents with Humanae Vitae which reference the supernatural and eternal dimensions of man, perhaps those dimensions do not figure enough in the encyclical. Indeed, when the encyclical was released, Ratzinger found that while the teaching was essentially correct, the encyclical relied too much on natural law and was not anthropologically comprehensive. He wrote, the reasoning for us at that time, and for me too, was not satisfactory. I was looking out for a comprehensive anthropological viewpoint. In, in an address to moral theologians in February 1999, John Paul II, in speaking about contraception, perceptively touched upon the anthropological principle that grounds moral analysis and which proceeds from God's own nature manifested in his acts of creation and redemption. He wrote, here we touch upon a central point of Christian doctrine concerning God and man. If we look closely at what is put into question by rejecting this teaching, it is the very idea of God's holiness. Those moral norms are simply the requirement from which no historical circumstance can dispense of the holiness of God who participates in concrete, not in abstract, in the individual human person. In dying for our sins, Christ recreated us in the original holiness that must express itself in our everyday intra-worldly activity. JP2 realizes that the holiness of God is actually the determinative factor in the evaluation of any human act. Yet although his writings are profoundly under, undergirded by the sense of the holiness of God, this holiness does not emerge thematically in his writings overly. <coughs> this essay will present the biblical evidence for the claim that the holiness of God is the underlying criterion by which human actions are ultimately evaluated and, uh, and purposes and proposes that only in the light of God's nature and holiness, which are one and the same, can the interior meaning and moral structure of human action be adequately evaluated. The Created Order, part one. The overriding concern of many Christian ethicists is the place of human subjectivity and freedom in the moral evaluation of an act, and rightly so. Previous understandings of the human person and the structure and meanings of acts are often dismissed as primitively uh, physicalistic. These views developed within the, uh, oh, sorry, the views developed within the outdated Judeo-Christian framework are exchanged for the enlightened views of the modern age, whose criteria are that man should, can only exercise freedom when he is no longer bound to either his biology or his history. In rejecting revelation, modern secularism with its emphasis on experience, it rejects the concept of a created order with a given human nature that has a telos. Nature is essentially rendered mute in the name of human freedom. History as an escape into meaning. The first words of the revelation to Israel, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created, 
uprooted the whole of pagan understanding and mythological thought, which was based on the cyclical understanding of time tied to the cyclical nature of nature, in which the gods were chaotic and often violent. In myths such as the Enuma Elish, man existed only as a pawn amongst the divine powers. Human acts had little value or meaning in the endlessly cyclical system, and man had little sense of agency. By, of, by way of contrast, the Hebrew revelation posited an absolute beginning point in creation, implying an end, a telos, which ends up being associated with his divine covenant with Israel. Only now could human actions be evaluated in relation to a final purpose. This revolutionary biblical concept of history is predicated on A, the will of God which inscribes a telos in every creature, and B, the implication that human acts carry meaning by either fulfilling or deforming the will of God. That is, individual human acts are integrally part of the salvific will of God for his creation. As the revelation to the Jews progresses, we discover that human acts either cohere with God's holiness, and therefore one is a part of the covenant and of God's people and God's design, or one's actions destroy that covenant. I want to look quickly, uh, and I will try here, with the, some principles of creation that undergird uh, uh, this claim. There's an absolute divide uh, in Hebrew revelation between that which is created and that which is not created, in other words, between the creation and God. Only God bara, only God creates, and he does it ex nihilo from nothing. We also see that in John's Gospel that it is the Logos, the divine word, who is the agent of creation through whom all things are made. In other words, all things receive their structure and their meaning and their end from the Logos, who is, of course, Christ. This agency of God is the first principle of creation which seems lost in the modern world. The second principle is the relationship of the one to the many or the plural existence to an original unity. In Genesis 1-2, God speaks his word successively into what's called the tohu vuvohu, the incohate mass. Remember, God creates the, the earth was formless and void, tohu vuvohu. That's the first thing that is created. And then God speaks into that, let there be light and there was light. Let this happen and it happens. So let this be divided and it's divided. But they all come from the original tohu vuvohu. Genesis 1 reveals that the multitude of particularities are always grounded in an original preceding unity. This means that the specificities of masculinity and femininity are grounded in and actually find their identity in an original unity. This ontological unity becomes the fundamental criterion for the evaluation of our actions. Man qua man. Genesis 1.26 states that man is created in God's image, as we know. A key to the divine nature is revealed in the divine inner dialogue that prefaces man's creation. If we're made in God's image, we have to know who is God and what is he like. And the first clue is when God says in this preface, let us make man in our image. This dialogue bears witness that there is some form of communion within God. He is one, and yet there's some form of communion mysteriously within God. As we know, the defining creed of Israel in Deuteronomy 6.4 states that the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. You hear that word Echad, one, or it's, it's actually translated in the prayer, uh, Jewish prayer book as unity. The un there is no unity Echad like the unity Echad of God. In several places in scripture, the word Echad is used to express a diversity possessed of a unity. In these instances, Echad does not have a monadic sense of an undifferentiated unity. For instance, Genesis 1.5 says, there was evening and there was morning one day, Yom Echad. There are two parts, Boker and Laila, morning and evening, but they make up the Yom Echad, the, the one day. Similar, similarly, in uh, Genesis 2.24, the man and the woman become Basar Echad, one flesh. Again, two genders coming together to form a unity. In these cases, one, Echad, has the sense of differences held together in a unity, or conversely, it is a unity of differences. This understanding of one, Echad, 
provides the opening for the possibility of a communion of difference that exists within the Godhead. If God is characterized by the reality of communion, then man made in his image is also so ordered. I'll punctuate my thoughts with drinks from the water. <laughs> this is further reinforced in Genesis 1.27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created Oto, him, singular. Male and female, he created them, Otam, plural. Only here, and not with the animal creation, is gender mentioned. This implies that gender functions in the man, in, human, in humanity, at a much higher level than in the animals, for gender in in human beings, not only enables procreation, but this one flesh union at the same time images forth the inner nature of God and his internal communion. Let us make man in our image. The third principle is the ordination to more life. As you notice, in Genesis, God creates, and then within that life, there is always the capacity and the commandment to bring forth more life, not death. God blessed them and said, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Blessing in Hebrew, barach, refers to having an abundance of something. Blessing is essentially tied to procreation for those who are faithful to the covenant. In Deuteronomy, it says, he will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also <laughs> bless the fruit of your body. The opposite of uh, fecundity, sterility, was never a sign of covenantal grace, but could be overcome by returning to God. Covenantal blessings such as fecundity flow from walking in obedience. Death and sterility are deformations of creation's ordination to life. Uh, rabbinical in, um, teaching uh, uh, confirms this in the Shohan uh, Aruch, which is the primary code book uh, for Judaism, argues, every man is obliged to marry in order to fulfill the duty of procreation. And whoever does not is as if he has shed blood diminished the image of God and caused the Holy Presence to depart from Israel. It's important to note here the link between willful non-procreation and the death of the future generation and the loss of the presence of God. Oneness of flesh. Within this context, these three principles of creation, the mystery of the oneness of flesh, the basarehad, the union here emerges. The term one uh, flesh occurs explicitly in Genesis 2, 24, where the primordial man and woman become one flesh. But the foundation for this one flesh unity can be found earlier in Genesis 1, 27. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This text functions in two ways. First, it announced that human masculinity and femininity is created in the context of the divine image. This would seem to indicate that human gendered exist, uh, existence and the finality of gender, fecundity, and communion are somehow reflective of the inner life in the wholeness, the oneness of God. The second function of the text reveals a tension between the one, made him, and the many, he makes them. God creates the singular one, and only after that does he create the plurality. There is a prior unity, just as in the beginning uh, of Genesis 1, how uh, other parts of creation emerge. But the other that is created is not merely the physical reproduction of the first one, i.e. the masculine, but the creation of a person who is other, and yet similar to and identifiable with the male. They are ordered to each other, forming the one flesh union, which is further ordered to the procreation of a third. In chapter 2 of Genesis, we see, how, we see how, in fact, one does lead to the many, similar to the process in Genesis 1. The oneness of the first man, the first Adam, the undifferentiated existence of Adam is not the oneness of unity of God's internal being. The Adam is alone, and this is not good. Astonishingly, although the first man's communion with God in Eden was not broken because of sin, Something constitutive of the man was missing. He is alone. Man is created to image forth in this world God's nature of communion in being. And so man cannot fulfill or be fulfilled the experience of 
uh, oneness in flesh unless he has the other. But notice that this union is not merely instrumental. The other is not created as an autonomous creature whose sexual union with the man is merely a moral instrumental unity. Here in Genesis 2, the original unity in the first Adam is the substance from which the woman is formed. The rib actually plays a key theological role. It symbolizes the prior ontological unity before differentiation. The sexual embrace is a return to this unity. The differentiation of male and female is predicated at some level on the original primordial unity that existed before the distinctions were made. Because of that original unity, the one flesh union is indissoluble. In Matthew 19, Christ, in restoring the fallen world to its original created order, provides a midrash on this process. What God has joined together, let no man separate. This reveals, A, that God is the agent who created the particularity of the one flesh union, and therefore, B, being willed by God, the oneness, one flesh union is indissoluble, both by God's will, but also by the way in which he created male and female. The one flesh union is not a contractual arrangement between separate independent individuals, but flows from the given structure of the person as originally being and from whom the other is differentiated. The marital embrace, which is the privileged expression of the one flesh union, is an iconic participation in the original primordial uni a union, unity, a union which, like the unity of God's nature, is overflowing with life and love. Now we come to holiness as criterion. The criterion which determines the very existence of the covenantal people of God is the call to holiness. To ensure this holiness, God provides extensive legislation given to the priests and tells Israel in, in a large section of Leviticus, which is called the uh, Holiness Code, be holy, for I am holy. It is one of the few places in Scripture where God identifies the rationale behind the law. To act contrary to the holiness of God is to act contrary to one's own identity. For man, holiness is always a derived reality. For the Hebrews, only God is holy. In Christ, one becomes holy only by identifying with and participating in his nature in the divine holiness. We see the danger of rejecting this holiness in God's condemnation of the unholy behavior of Israel. Through Hosea, after years of apostasy and injustice, God finally announces that Israel is lo ami, you're not my people. Without holiness, Israel ceases to exist. The laws of the Torah especially link human sexual behavior with holiness, determining which actions are connatural with and those which are antithetical to God's holiness. A, special, a specific section called the Holiness Code is unusual, as I said, because it gives the rationale, be holy. This rationale is given actually five times throughout the text. The value of human action is determined by its relationship to God's holiness. Furthermore, a large number of these laws concern detailed aspects of sexual behavior. To be holy, to be properly ordered to God, one's willed actions cannot contradict the inherent nature of holiness. The symbolic function of holiness. To understand the unique function of holiness as a criterion of human action, we need to understand that Scripture conceives of human existence as having two stages. The narrative of creation shows that before sin, the paradisal state of man was characterized by the tangible nearness of God and the total transparency of human divine relationships. This was the state of shalom, of total integration in justice, in which the body was fully under the control of the spirit of man in communion with God. With the rejection of God caused by the desire to become like God, a disintegration of this communion is effected. 
The result is that now man lives not in an integrated state of unity, but of disintegration. His existence is one of separation from God, yielding disintegration, disintegrated relationships and interior um, brokenness characterized by fear. This conflictual situation is reflected not only in man's fractured interior, but also in the fracturing of the world he inhabits. It is upon this newly integrated fallen reality that the cult of Israel is predicated. This is shown in the Mosaic priest's uh, role, which is specified by his ability to, quote, distinguish between the holy and the common and between the clean and the unclean. Before the fall, the, these categories, all of those did not exist. You didn't have clean and unclean, you just had clean. Because the preternatural communion with God was broken, the covenant with Israel was instituted by God to show the way back to holiness, the precondition for renewed communion. It primarily served as a way to negotiate between these different spheres of reality, enabling Israel to avoid or deal with being in a state of existence that was inimical to God. For instance, a woman was in a state of impurity because of her menstrual cycle. She could not go into the temple because that would be cont uh, contradicting holiness. The same with man with body fluxes. <clears throat> what happened is that after a time, uh, the person would have to wait for a period of time. They'd have to go through, it would have to be healed or stopped, whatever the issue was, and they often went through a water ritual. When we look for a unifying link to these causes of impurity, it could be a mold on stone, it could be a corpse, a dead body, it could be um, a menstrual cycle or some issue of blood, um, what we find is that we see that they are somehow linked to death on a symbolic level. Blood is a primary symbol of death, and gametic, gametic, uh, gametic material dies in menstruation, and when seed is wasted uh, and disease is, is a form of bodily disintegration, we see this symbol of death. And so therefore, uh, when that is present, it, you cannot go into the temple, which is the holiness of God, or contains the holiness of God. For the Jews, one place of holiness existed was not only in the temple, but within the home. This is clearly seen in the many law, laws that regulate behavior in the home uh, and, and how it is to cohere with divine holiness. The home of the covenant was seen as a parallel uh, to the temple and was considered a mishkan katan, a small temple, which is, of course, equivalent to the domestic church. The holiness of the temple, which in the Torah was already related to behavior in the home, especially sexual behavior, was it was, uh, it was existed, sorry, in the temple, also now was extended to the home. This relationship continued to be explored in the rabbinical writings, and we see a high point with uh, Samuel Hirsch, uh, where, and he writes, he draws a parallel between the ritual baths, the mikvah, of the high priest, who is readying himself to enter into the Holy of Holies on the day Yom Kippur. And this is compared with the wife, who then also goes through a, a bath ritual, uh, every, every month when she's preparing after a menstrual cycle to become purified to have sexual relationships with her husband. Both must go through the mikveh, the purifying bath, to be able to participate in holy activities. Hirsch writes, he, rather, Hirsch compares the married woman's immersion in the water of the mikveh prior to resuming marital relationships to the kohens, the high priest's immersion in the mikveh prior to entering the sanctuary for temple services in Jerusalem. On Yom Kippur, the climax of the temple ritual was the entry of the high priest into the Holy of Holies. Five times during the day, he would immerse himself in the mikvah, and the immersions were symbolic acts of purification, which had effect of raising his spiritual status. Hirsch is not afraid to compare the preparation ritual for the most sacred act within Judaism to sexual union. This is not uh, surprising, because marriage was understood as a form of holiness within Judaism. In fact, the tractate of the Talmud, which deals with marriages and betrothals, is called Kiddushin, which means sanctification. Marriage is a form of sanctification. Hirsch, in his work, shows the similarity between the dynamic that is at work in the temple and that which is in the home. Both are ordered to and participate in the holiness of God. One thing quickly, I, in this section I just want to, which is uh, ancient Israel behavior and holiness, is to note that in the revelation of God's name in Genesis 3.14, I am who I am, 
uh, it's a mysterious name, but it, it comes from the verb to be, which seems to mean that God is saying to Moses that I am all existence, all being, all life is me. So therefore, anything that is of death is contrary to, anything that is sterile is contrary to the nature of God. The other text that's important is uh, Genesis 38, which is the Onan text. Um, this text deals with uh, a Semitic custom, later called uh, the Law of Liveret. Judah in the text has two sons, Er and Ona, and uh, Er, first of all, marries Tar uh, Tamar, but because he's wicked, the Lord kills him. Uh, I just thought as they wrote that, that's a convenient way maybe to get rid of an unwanted son-in-law, I suppose. <laughs> According to the custom of the time, Judah then orders, the father orders the younger son, Ona, to go into Tamar, the wife of his uh, older brother, and to have sexual relationships with her so that Er can have uh, a continued line. Onan goes in, but uh, he intervenes to prevent the natural conclusion of the sexual act by spilling his seed on the ground. But, on, quote, but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so he went into his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. There has been a consistent history within both Judaism and Christianity that sees this as a form of a coitus interruptus. Uh, uh, one of the tractates says, whoever emits semen in vain deserves death, for it is said in the, in the scripture, quoting this passage from Onan, the thing which he did was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord slew him. <coughs> and then the comment is, he is as though he shed blood. By doing that act, it's as if he committed murder. This text shows us three things. First, the intentional emission of semen while preventing its natural function within the procreative act is evil. Second, it is so grave as to constitute a capital offense. And third, the gravity of the sin is because this unnatural act is likened onto murder. This is well established within Judaism and still pertains today and also within Christianity. Now, there's been an attempt in our modern era, perhaps because wanting to... Um, deroot or to undermine uh, humanity vitae to say, oh, no, no, it has something to do rather uh, that he didn't want to uh, fulfill the law of liberate and therefore God killed him. But that's a false exegesis, and it's very simple because in Deuteronomy 25.9, the, uh, the, the punishment for not carrying out the liberate law was public shaming. We see, if you remember in the book of Ruth where uh, the, the guy takes the, is supposed to take the uh, shoe and at the courtyard and say, he who, who has not gone into my, uh, to the woman or something along those lines. This type of reasoning, separating as it does the emission of semen from its teleological function, becomes as a way to delegitimize the Onan own story as a support for humanity vitae. But biblical, biblically, that's not sustainable. So there are the parts of the Old Testament, and then we move into Christ, the Logos, and the Revelation. The incarnation and revelation of Christ initiates God's last movement in God's redemption, which takes the form of a new creation. Often overlooked is that Christ, as the Logos, is the intelligibility of creation. When Jesus said the last word, his last words, it is finished, all is accomplished, he then opens the door so that we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who can, receive, who can renew us in Christ, and he begins to live in us. Fulfilled now, the law, fulfilled now, the law is lived not only in its external form, but now from its interiority, which Christ is enabling us to do through the Spirit. Christ, through his passion, gives man a new heart, which is able to perceive the interior meaning of the law, hidden by sin. During his ministry, Jesus showed that the transformation that was needed for salvation, more was needed than the salvation of the righteousness. We see that in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5, 20. Reading the external words of Moses, the Jewish people failed to grasp the interiority of the law, which the Logos, standing in their midst, was revealing to them. Typologically, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus becomes the new Mount Moses, and authoritatively teaches that man must cohere to the holiness of God, not only in his outward actions, but in his interior being. Your righteousness, your holiness, must surpass that of the righteousness of, of the Pharisees. In his encounter with the Pharisees over his teaching on marriage, Jesus showed that divorce, which becomes a form of death, was in fact contrary to the will of God's creation, resulting as it did from the hardness of heart, from sin, from turning from God. In Christ's new reality, divorce and remarriage are not possible because they are forms of adultery and hence mitigate against the holiness of God. 
Even in the old law, there is a foreshadowing of that. For priests were absolutely forbidden to marry a divorced woman. And why? Because the priest is holy to his God. The holiness of the priest is con uh, would be contradicted by the status of engagement with uh, divorce. In restoring uh, the original intent of the created order by taking away the distorting effects of the fall, Christ opens up a new way to living. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. Thus to in Introduce separation or division into the divinely willed structure of the one flesh union is to reject the salvific work of the cross. St. Paul then takes all of this and makes a huge appropriation of it. And he is aware of the transformation, uh, transformative effect of Christ. Uh, when he meets Christ, he has to then spend uh, a long time going through each part of his teaching that he had received from Gamaliel and other rabbis to understand it, how it could now be Christocentric. Um, he then, and particularly we see it in Romans, where he begins to see the, the role of nature in the revelation of God. He writes, so those, those who reject God, are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, and their senseless minds were darkened. Therefore God gave them to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for, and almost universally it's translated as a lie, but in fact, the Greek says the lie. There's the truth of God, and there is the lie that we can reject God. The lie, whichever form it may take, is all part and parcel of the lie of Satan. For Paul, the truth of God is encoded in the physical structure of reality. Consequently, the rejection of the created order is a rejection of God inevitably and leads to a form of self-worship and sexual immorality. For, ba for Paul, the rebellion against God is iconically situated in the body in which the body's ordination to life is perverted. Their women exchange natural relations for unnatural, and the men, likewise, are consumed with passion for one another. To reject the created structures and teleological sexual functions of our persons is to accept the lie that, is funda that fundamentally separates <coughs> man from God. So to summarize a lot of what goes on in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we can see some points, three points. First of all, there's an integral unity of body and soul. Creation, as well as the incarnation, demonstrate that flesh can cohere with the holiness of God. The narrative of creation shows that man, qua man, is a composite body and soul, in which the human actions, both of body and soul, interpenetrate each other. Consequently, willed acts involving the body affect the person's spiritual life and vice versa. No dualism between these two spheres is possible the biblical vision of man. Bodily acts are not indifferent, principle two. God's people are called to holiness, which means that one's bodily acts have to conform, have integrity with God. Salvation is not a mental or even a theological construct, but is lived out through the willed acts of our body. And three, agency and salvation. In the Pauline vision of salvation, there is an, enact, an initial act of justification which only Christ can effect. Being separated by God through sin, there was nothing we could do to bring about our salvation or the state of justice. But once justified in baptism, the salvific gift has to be worked out in and through our daily actions. In Philippian, Paul, Philippians, Paul reveals the interplay between the divine and the human agency in salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's our part. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God is already there in the action. That's what grace is all about, but we also have to cooperate. Salvation is the coherence of man's nature with the holiness of God. Again, salvation is the coherence of man's nature with the holiness of God. Having restored man to the original state of justice and now indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Man is called to bring all of his actions into conformity with the divine holiness, not in his own strength, but in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. In this way, the freedom of the human person is deeply respected. Man's bodily acts are not indifferent, but are an intrinsic part of the salvific process, either helping or deterring one's communion with God. Towards the end here, we talk about the theological form of marriage in Ephesians. As Mary Douglas showed, 
she was a, 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 an English anthropologist, to evaluate the meaning of a specific phenomena in a culture, you have to understand the overarching symbol, st symbolic structure of the culture. You can't just take any one instance of a cultural rite or ritual and understand it. You always have to place it in the culture and understand what's the overarching meaning of that culture. In our case, we're now, we come now to uh, examining the overarching meaning and symbolic uh, function of marriage, the one flesh union with Judeo, within the Judeo-Christian view of reality. Temple imagery and sacrificial language in Ephesians. Ephesians is thematically structured around the concept of unity. Uh, Paul begins uh, in uh, Ephesians 1.10, uh, focused on the word uh, anakephileo sasthai, which means to be gathered together under one head. The mystery of the Father's will, a plan for the fullness of time, to, and then the word anakephilei o sasthai, to, to gather together all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. So this, everything is meant for this unity. Then in chapter 4, Paul continues the emphasis on unity by writing there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. So he, he shows theologically how this unity is worked out. And then in a culmination to this theme of unity, Paul expounds on the final theme of unity, which is that of the surprisingly marital embrace in Ephesians 5.32. In his conclusion, I, Paul identifies with the marital, he identifies the marital unity with the unity between Christ and the church. This is a great musterion, mystery, but I am speaking about Christ and his church. The profundity of this declaration is, is really difficult uh, to, to understand, to grasp. As von Balthasar says, Paul is here articulating the theological norm, the theological norm which is constitutive of the authentic form of marriage. In a sudden moment of insight, Paul presents the essential reciprocity, uh, reciprocity or convertibility of the man-woman relationship with the Christ church relationship. That at least seems to be what he's doing. This reciprocal relationship becomes the evaluative norm for any willed act that is inserted into the process of sexual union because it affects the meaning the, of the unity of the one flesh union of man and woman and also of Christ and his church, which it is to image forth. Paul exegesis, bring, his exegesis brings into relief the unity of the somatic embrace. In this embrace, the, uh, the theme of unity reaches conclusions. Most importantly, Paul presents the relationship between Christ and the church as the archetypical ground for marriage. There is a theological paralleling going on. He discloses that the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. But this, uh, this headship is qualified by Christ's sacrificial love. The husband is to love the Christ, as, uh, to love his wife as Christ loved the church. This relational symmetry is unprecedented. The human marital communion is perfected when it takes on its theological and therefore teleological, its ecclesial identity. It's also important to note the cultic language in Ephesians 5. The Lord sanctifies, makes holy the church, cleansing her like the mikvah, uh, so she is holy and without spot, and there is the washing, which again refers to the baths. These are terms related to the temple sacrifice, to the state of holiness where purity was essential. It is the husband now who has to be concerned about uh, the state of his wife. And we see here now that the cultic terms are fulfilled, not overcome, but fulfilled in Christ. Sacrifice in Christ never ends in death, but in life, in abundance of life. It would be impossible to envision any contraceptive measures between Christ and his church. This is very telling. It would be impossible to envision any contraceptive measures between Christ and his church. Uh, I'll skip the rest part, but I'll, I'll end it by uh, with just simply... Um, kind of uh, parachuting into the very last uh, two, two or three paragraphs. By way of a simple practical analysis extrapolating from the theological framework of Ephesians 5, we can ask if a specific act of contraceptive behavior attacks the sacrificial values that flow from any genuine act that participates in Christ's cross. Does a specific intervention enable the practice of humility, 
promote self-denial, promote self-denial, or help the co couple to learn how to bear their cross as a couple. Alternatively, does a specific act circumvent or damage some or all of these Christ-like values? These are the cri uh, critical questions because an attack on the unity of one flesh union on its given structure, its meaning or its telos, is also an attack on the union between Christ and his church. Conclusion, it's a short one. Contraception wills the separation of the inherent, inherent procreative dimension of sexual union, thus reducing the conjugal act to an experience without a form or a telos. Contraceptive sexual union partakes of an illusion. The bodies of the spouses appear to function in a manner that coheres with their created design. And the subjective experience of sexual communion appears to have been attained. However, when the inscribed meanings of the body and its processes are denied, then those appearances are emptied of their integral meaning and no longer serve as a way to experience the holiness of God. Nor can these emptied acts image forth the Trinity's own intra-communal love, nor can they image forth Christ's love for the church, which is precisely the theological meaning of the sexual embrace and its ordination to life. They proclaim sterility, they proclaim death, which is the very antithesis of God's holiness. The voice of God in Leviticus is still the living voice of God today. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy.